Hi, this is Elliot Fishman, and welcome to a Facebook Live. Today is the 25th of April, so we're kind of warming up here in Maryland, and hopefully wherever you are, it's warming up. And uh, happy Easter, happy Passover to everybody. And um, I know a lot of you are on vacation. A lot of kids are on vacation. Driving to work is very easy. And a lot of people are off. We're still pretty busy clinically. So uh, I was trying to figure out, <coughs> excuse me if I don't choke here. I was trying to figure out what to speak about this week. And um, I came up with this about uh, what's hot in the CT literature. And I, I forgot to look up what's hot. But, but, you know, one thing just to tell you about the literature so two things CT as us does on a monthly basis. Most of you, hopefully you know this. Uh, we put up all of the really good articles that were published the prior month. So we put up anywhere between 40 and 80 articles across a range of topics, and we have very nice links to them. Also, when I read a lot of the articles, we put up pearls. So we're averaging probably 100 to 150 pearls a month. And you can look at them in the pearl section. You can see them by this month. They're developed by, divided by categories, liver, pancreas, spleen, uh, AI, radiomics, 3D, all different categories, like maybe 50 categories divided up. So it's really easy to use. And that kind of keeps you up to date what's in the literature. Okay, so we're really kind of on top of it. I'm putting in there a lot of the things I read that are in press. So you'll see a lot of referral to articles that are published today. For example, Elsevier Publishers does an incredible job. When you get something accepted, they publish it online, and as the official link, about three to four weeks after it's accepted, you may not see it in print for nine to 12 months, perhaps, but online, it's, um, it's there right away. And I will tell you is you have to read the online versions or the in-press versions because nine or 10 months later, 12 months later, it's old news. And so we're trying to keep all of you guys up to date with what's going on and um, trying to go from there. So in saying that, what have I been reading? I, I, I seem to see a lot of articles about medical error. There's a lot of articles these days about dual energy. We've written a lot of articles on cinematic renderings. You see a lot of those things coming along. You see a lot of articles on management or people skills and things like that. But really where I am seeing the most articles is in this whole area of artificial intelligence. And it is, is interesting that it's a combination of maybe two or three types of articles. So there's a lot of articles generically on AI. So one of the things, and we've posted the links of this on Facebook, every big organization seems to be releasing their principles about AI, where they think AI is going, what things it needs to have within it. And so the other week, Canada had their a publication. There's a big publication in radiology maybe a week ago. The European societies maybe two weeks ago had a publication. China had a publication maybe two or three weeks ago as well. Australia the uh, and New Zealand, the, the, that area is there, uh, also had a publication. So what you're seeing now is a lot of the big organizations and the societies trying to put together at least their view of AI and where it's going and how it might fit into the big process. Now, I have to admit, the articles seem very similar. I don't see really major discrepancies or differences. They talk about privacy. They talk about proving things, how to use it. To me, um, it's kind of like you're talking about something that you're really not sure where it's going to go. It's, they're all very well-meaning articles, and they're good to read because it's kind of interesting to see where people are thinking, but I think you're trying to create or potentially in your mind create rules for something that you don't know it, how it's going to actually be. And I think, of course, that's very, very challenging if you don't know where, what the result is, what the product looks like. It's hard to say how you control the product. I mean, you can say we need to control privacy. We need to make certain that images are not being lost, uh, that, that um, people, the people's information is not exposed. 
you know, uh, sites like I spoke last week or a couple of weeks ago, or I'm going to speak next week, actually, because I heard a talk last week by Reed Jobs on Count Me In, which is a way uh, he's put together a group between the Biden Institute uh, and the Emerson Collective, uh, I think um, Brigham, and I'm leaving somebody out, unfortunately, where they put together a group that's trying to collect information from patients, Count Me In is, and I'll speak about it in detail next week, so I don't want to get into it, but their goal is to collect lots of information about specific diseases, curate the information, and then push it out to researchers, helping push along the, the, the act of discovery. And that's spectacular. So we're seeing that, but, but the privacy becomes critical. And so one of the things Count Me In does is they have really good security, they have really good privacy, and so the information indeed will be there. So just think of it that way, okay. But, but so the articles really are kind of planning. The other part of articles I see are articles which are actually looking at results and looking at where things are going. So I've mentioned to you that there's an article, for example, two or three weeks ago from the group at Special Surgery in New York that shows an algorithm they developed for detecting fractures where not only is it is it good, but it's better than regular radiologists and equal to or even better than subspecialty radiologists, with they, with, with, which they are. So now you got to think about what does that mean? If you have somebody who can read films better than most radiologists, you probably have to use it. We talk about apps being developed that are not super brilliant, but are super good in terms of triage. So. For example, I think it's AI Docs, and don't quote me because I don't want to name the wrong company, give the wrong company credit, but they developed a way of detecting blood on a head CT. And so what they do is, particularly for teleradiology companies where, you know, you read a film 40, 45 minutes later, what it does now is every head CT that comes in, you can look at for blood. And it's very sensitive for blood, but what's the worst case? If it sees blood or thinks it sees blood, it moves it to the front of the reading list. You're gonna to have to read the case anyway. So you read it 40 minutes earlier, but that's the point. You say 40 minutes and they notice that's 40 minutes earlier than it would have been. And in a patient with a bleed, that can be a matter of life and death or just life and brain that's lost. So it's just a wonderful app. It's nothing very brilliant. And I, I'd say that with all due respect to the developers, that they did an incredible job. But it's something so simple because it's not really changing what we do. We still have to read the films, but it's changing how we relate to the process that we're much more successful dealing with the patients, dealing with referring clinicians, and dealing with the whole process. Okay. Then I, I've read, and this is with Google, you know, in London now, and I, we have a lot of people online, so let me just say hello to people where they, where they are in Chapel Hill, John, and which is in Maryland here outside of Baltimore, Finksburg, which is a couple an hour plus away in Central Florida, Roland, and Mahir, who is in Paris, and uh, Abdenor, and hopefully I pronounced it correctly, is from Somalia. Um, you know, in I've read these articles, and probably many of you have also, that, for example, in London, there's such a shortage of radiologists that a lot of the chess CTs and chess films are not being read for four or five months. And obviously, if you don't read it for four or five months, it becomes worthless because things that are bad have gotten worse and things you know, that could have been discovered aren't being discovered. That's really bad medicine. What they figured out is Google has figured out a way of separating normal from abnormal. Okay, so what you do is if you can't read all the films, have Google's pull deep mind, which is Google, pull out all the abnormals, let the radiologists read the abnormals and let them get to the normals when they get a chance, which maybe never, but you want those abnormals where you can impact management, impact therapy, impact outcome to be read in a timely fashion. And so you can use deep learning. It doesn't need to say whether it's pneumonia or cancer or this or that. Just tell me it's abnormal. We'll read it faster. And to me, I cannot imagine where that's not going to be standard of care, <coughs> that whether it's the hospital, whether it's the ICU, people run a program now that could uh, pick up pneumothoraces, pick up pneumonia on chest x-ray, pick up catheters being misplaced. All that's been written in the last two weeks. Well, imagine it in your ICU where you tend not to read the films that have done two in the morning to nine in the morning, 
think about all those ICU films where the triage, that the ones that are important, someone is reading in a timely fashion and the impact on patient care is so much better. So I think one of the big things will not be a specific product, but it'll be how it changes how we do things. Not that it's taking away studies, but it's just how it orders what we do, how we do things in a more timely fashion, in a fashion that's better for the patient. So that makes radiology look good, but it's very limited cost. So I see that becoming a very, very important thing, and it should be. Uh, very, very important in doing things with patient triage. Okay, so, so that's one thing. The other thing now we're seeing is just the fact that computer programs are being really good. We published an article yesterday, uh, Linda Chu and the, our Felix group, that says that 99% of the time we could separate cancer from normal pancreas. Can you imagine you look at every pancreas and cancer is found? Looking at radiomics, there's no special technique or protocols. We can look at the texture, at the findings. We look at five, we're looking at 500 findings. Now we can look at 50, and maybe six or seven are most important. But we can look and determine whether or not there's cancer there. And then, of course, we have other algorithms we're developing that can find cancer within a scan. So imagine the combination of radiomics with deep learning, with uh, visualization techniques, putting all those pieces and parts together becomes a very, very powerful tool to, in pancreatic cancer, thanks to the Luskarn Foundation, in pancreatic cancer, be able to detect the earliest tumors. So we are doing that. In saying that, if you want to read about the Felix Project, if you go CT is Us, the main page, we've been building out this deep learning. Now we have a category called Felix. And in there, we have all of the articles, including the technical articles that we've published. There's probably more than a dozen. We have more recent articles, like the one in AJR came out yesterday, which is looking at using radiomics for detection and differentiation between cancer and normal pancreas. And then we have some of the things there in the late press, the article that was in NPR, things like that that make us look good, of course, uh, are all together. So you can look at that very nicely. We're also building out the part about uh, information in AI. So there's lots of articles that f- they're from journals, but we have a lots of articles that are from the lay press, things that are in Fortune Magazine, a Harvard Business Reviewer, um, Forbes, or New York Times, or anywhere. We put that information there so that you could really learn what the state of the art is and where the state of the art is going. Now, let me just look at the list again in terms of questions. So uh, Jerry is from the Czech Republic, and uh, Ann, hello, from Utah. Uh, Vince Brown, and that's a big issue. I hope the text could possibly bring it to the doctor's attention, too. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think you're referring to the fact about seeing blood on a scan. But, you know, for example, teleradiology companies are looking at scans from 150 to 500 sites. And so there's so much stuff coming in and they tend not to call the doctors, or the doctors would be inundated by phone calls. I think if you're in one hospital, like you're at Hopkins, the tech sees blood, they call upstairs to the radiologist, and they can expedite things. But I like it where you take the human factor out, where every scan is looked at. It's not like the tech got busy and meant to call, but there was a delta trauma and had to do something else. I like it where you get around, you get around things. Now, Someone says, what about um, one-trick ponies? I I think, you know, right now, it's like us. We we have better than 90% accuracy for detecting early pancreatic cancer. And now we're working real hard on neuroendocrine tumors. Now, that's going to be very valuable, but it's not going to replace a radiologist reading an abdominal CT because you need to look at the liver, the pancreas, the kidney, the spleen, the bowel, nodes, the aorta, the vessels. There's so much to look at. Maybe someday it will do that. But I think we need to build, and the one thing I think that you have to remember, and I've told this to people now, AI is not, it's not gonna be today where it's just no AI, and then you wake up tomorrow morning, and oh my God, everything's AI. It's gonna be a gradual transition. So it may be something easy as triage, and then you're gonna see something as easy as a second reader for fractures, or something as easy as detecting pancreatic masses, or suggesting pancreatic masses. And that's just in CT. Think about things like MAPO. 
but it's not going to be an all or none phenomenon. If you're sitting back there and saying it's going to one day you're going to wake up and someone's going to say, don't come to work. The computers have taken over. I don't think that's going to happen. But I also think you need to be paying attention to what's happening now. If you wait for everything, and again, some of the stuff is very theoretical and, you know, in some sense probably is a one trick pony and it may not be much of a pony. One trick pony, that's an album by Paul Simon, right? Um, but I think it's this ability to pay attention to what's going on, to really look at what you need. There's a, a meeting in Baltimore on risk management, a couple, I think next week that I'm speaking at, and we had this conference call. And after I was speaking to one of the Hopkins lawyers, we were talking about the fact is when does legal get involved? Is there a point where legal needs to say you need to use this deep learning method, that you need to use this AI method because you're putting patients at risk, that it may not be up to you. It's when does the pendulum swing that maybe you should use AI, maybe you shouldn't, to the point is everybody uses it and it's just standard of care. That may take more than a couple of years, but I think those are the questions that need to be answered. So, um, it, you know, uh, again, going back to the licensing, like Patrick makes the point, if you have to buy a lot of licenses, it'll be very expensive. Yeah, I think in the short term, it's not. It's a little different, but I think long term, you're going to see companies kind of like the Apple store where you buy what you need, but you buy it from one place. You're not going to be buying it from Elliot Fishman and Joe Smith and Paul Seymour and 100 places. Then who's going to integrate that into your packs? Remember, it's the last mile that counts. If you have really good software, but it's not integrated into workflow, it's not being used. I always said that if I was forming a company, I wouldn't do a company to do discovery in AI. I would do a company that integrates AI, that I become the Apple store. You give me your stuff. I make sure it looks the same to everybody, every app. The buttons are the same, so the um, learning curve is very low. Remember, the success of the Apple store in great part is that you have to be on the Apple platform, but you make everybody use it the same way. And so from a developer's perspective, it makes it easy. You know if you follow the rules, people will know what to do. So I think that's very, very exciting. And that's something um, I think that works out very well. Uh, now, let's see what else. Um, I'm running out of time. Um, say hello to Bot, who's happy to be here. And uh, Julika, CT exams accessible to smartphones. Is it soon to come? Well, the answer is we've helped develop is something called the Web Viewer, which is on an iPhone where you can look at all your cases in real time with the same accuracy as a workstation, do 3D. We're working on cinematic rendering. So iPhones, and uh, definitely you can. Look at the, go to Web Viewer on the Apple Store. You can see some really cool technology. And there's a question, what do I think about brain perfusion? Uh, I mean, we do a lot of brain perfusion here. Uh, again, it's a challenging study, but we, we do get good results. People now are arguing surely for infarct or any of the brain-related issues, bleed and the like. Should you go to MR? Should you have MR in the ER? I mean, CT is very fast, but MR has perhaps certain advantages, though that's probably beyond my field of expertise, so I won't go any further into that. So, um, question, do I think Pax Vendors will buy some of the smaller companies? The answer, of course, is yes, because that's been the tradition of radiology, or a tradition in the world today. Big Pharma, find someone who has something really good, some drug or some technology, and they buy the company. And I think that's what you're going to see. So at the end of the day, the people who have the real power, like the Siemens and GEs of the world, who have the workstations, have the entire process. I do think that they will be challenged by Google. There's no specific order. Amazon, Apple, and NVIDIA, who are going to build the next generation. And it's kind of going to be like, I think, like the Maginot Line in France in World War II, going around the traditional players, because traditionally they have not been incredible at early uh, ideas and high tech and really taking advantage of what things. And think of Amazon doesn't have all these relic systems. They can just go forward like a, a freight train. So I think that's going to happen, though. A lot of the companies like NVIDIA, um, Amazon, Google are just hiring really good people. They pay really, really well. 
and they hire really good people. They're really good at interviewing, they're really good for recruiting the right people. So you're not gonna fluff and end up at Google. They're gonna, they would they drop you before your 16th interview. Anyway, if anyone has any other questions, how do you think the long lasting x-ray tubes? Yeah, I think the longer the tube, the less downtime. So yeah, that's, again, kind of uh, not the topic of this talk, but I think it, it is important. Technology is getting better, and it's important for uptime to be improving, and we've had some issues with that, and we're trying to push that along. So with that, if anyone has any questions, they can still ask me, but I think perhaps we're at uh, 20 minutes. We'll call it a day. We'll thank you for your attention. And next week, I did mention it, but I'll tell you, uh, I'm telling Lily, who's sitting next to me, that we're going to do and count me in. So I'm going to tell you everything you know to count me in. And just to let you know, count me in was, I have a 45 record, count me in. That was Gary Lewis and the Playboys, like 1966. Gary Lewis and the Playboys, if you know anything about 60s music, and I was listening to the 60s on Sirius Radio today. This is not a plug for Sirius Radio, by the way. But if they want to give me a discount on my monthly thing, I, I wouldn't mind it, but it's like eight bucks. Uh, what are they going to give me? 80 cents off 10%. Um, but the, the most famous song by, by Gary Lewis and the Playboys, it was the number one song in 1966 this week, because I heard the countdown yesterday or the day before, this diamond ring. Gary Lewis is the son of Jerry Lewis. Just full of trivia here. We're telling you everything you need to know. And with that, I don't want to tell you anything else, but have a wonderful day. Catch you later. Ciao, ciao, ciao.